How are you guys tonight? Let me just put my, my Raider keychain right here. Sorry. I'm not making any friends, I know. It's all good. Jesus was an outcast too, right? Oh, man. Can you guys turn the lights up just a scotch? Do those lights come up just a hair, or are they on or off, Ellie? Just a little bit. I want to see these faces that are here in this room tonight. It's all good. Tonight, well, brother, I said I wanted a music stand, but I didn't know you were going to give me, like, the 1972 model. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Everything else is brand new in this place. I've known this building since I was a little kid. I knew when it was called Faith Fellowship and Faith Generations. Nobody knows, because I'm a dinosaur. When, this, when, when, when Elliot and Tiffany uh, took over as pastors here and they began to step into uh, what is becoming and has become this amazing work in the city of Lodi, um, and, they, and they, Elliot and I were talking, he was telling me about the name Lifeline, and he was telling me about the, the heart behind it. Uh, those of you that are in here that Maybe you're a business owner, uh, maybe you're involved in team sports, maybe you're involved in where you work, you're a part of branding, or in any way, shape, or form involved in trying to come up with a name or an idea or anything like that. For, for a church, for a pastor, when God gives them a name of something, many, many times it's because God is giving them something that, that they don't even really understand yet or that they really don't know what it's going to become. It's very, it's very before it's time kind of a thing. And I remember listening to Elliot talk about the name Lifeline. And at the, be, at the beginning when he said it to me, I didn't really, I didn't really get it. Like it was, it was a great name, but I didn't really get what it was going to become. And as God has raised them up as the wonderful leaders that they are, and as every, I was telling Mark, every time I come here, I see more and more uh, of the gifts of God alive here at this church. It's evident because we carry the gifts of God. And as we use the gifts of God and as we begin to display what God has given to us, the evidence is all around us. And I see it all, all across this facility. I see it in everything. And that is a testament to how when God spoke to Elliot and Tiffany said, this place is going to be called Lifeline, it's because there was a heart being birthed in them as leaders to begin to raise up people who had a heart for people outside of these walls, that they wanted to be able to be a lifeline. Now, I say all that because what the Lord wants me to share with you tonight is very much in sync with that concept. At the very beginning of this year, um, way over across town on the other side of the tracks is a place called Gravity. I know it's a place that many have feared to tread once in a while. But at the beginning of the year, we began going through a a series of, of teachings that we called Shine Brighter. And it was this, it was this, deep dive into scripture. I started in the very beginning in the book of Genesis, and I went all the way through the Bible, and I began to track all the way through scripture the concept of what it is in the Bible to have God's light. How God's light was one of the very first verses spoken in scripture when God literally said, let there be light. And as you begin to weave your way all through the Bible, you begin to find that this consistent theme, this consistent, really the identity, the characteristic of God that I saw up on the screen earlier, that God actually is light. That this characteristic and this display of God that started in the beginning is now carrying on through us. It's not a new idea. It's not a new concept. It's something that was originated in the heart of God and Much like we're talking about being a lifeline to the world, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about what Jesus meant when he called us the light of the world. There's so many scriptures, I don't have enough room tonight, time-wise, to go through all of them, so I'm just going to give you guys like the K-Love hits tonight of of scriptures. Philippians chapter 2, 
Verse number 15 and 16 says these words. It says, try to shine as lights among the people of this world as you hold firmly to the message that gives life. Try to shine as lights among the people of the world. This very clear instruction or this very clear encouragement that God has given us something that when we begin to understand it and we recognize it, that we can literally place ourselves in positions in the world around us, in the churches that we go to, in the places that we live and the, the places that we work, and we literally have the opportunity to begin to shine something that without us, it is not shining. The message that I want to clearly give to you tonight, and, and we're going to look at it a couple different ways, is that God has placed something inside of his church, inside of his sons and his daughters, that if they don't recognize and they don't choose to cooperate with and they don't choose to allow it to display itself, the world is actually a darker place. The world is actually dim until we begin to step into the identity and ultimately the role that God has given to us here in this world. God has instructed his people to shine and to shine brighter, that there is a, there is a way for us to begin to understand that, that we have a capacity to shine the light of God, but that there's a capacity to actually turn it up even more. And that there are ways that God uses us for that to increase. And that's one of the things that, that blesses me when I come here is I see the light shining brighter. It's getting more and more and more and more. I, don't, I could give you guys a lot of analogies of how light gets brighter, but you guys understand the concept. We've all been around a bonfire, a campfire. We've all been around even a birthday cake where you put one candle and it's just like, oh, that's cool, but I'm going to be 52 here in a minute. And it's like when you put 52 of those babies on top, yeah. it's way, way, way different. There's an intensity because of the volume that begins to happen. When Jesus said the words to his followers, he's right in the middle of a famous sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about all these things. He's like, you're the, the salt of the earth. He's like, you're, you're like a city on a hill, all these things. He literally says to the people that are listening, you are the light of the world. He called himself the light of the world also. He referred to himself as the light that had come into the darkness, but Jesus was stepping into a role where he was prophetically transferring what was soon going to take place into the hearts of his followers. He was speaking to them in every parable, in every teaching, things that they could not comprehend yet because they didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. But every word that Jesus talked to them prophetically, you can guarantee that on the day of Pentecost, the light came on and they began to remember the things that Jesus had said. And all of a sudden it begins to click and they begin to recognize, oh, that's what he meant. We now carry God's light into this world. We are the light of the world. I want to take you guys to a letter that was written to one of the, the first churches. Um, and before we read this letter, I want to give you a little bit of backstory because this letter was written by uh, the Apostle Paul and it was written from a jail cell and it was written from a perspective that I find to be very unique. I'll give you guys like a super, super brief, just little snapshot of his life. He came to Christ in a radical way. God called him into ministry. God took him into the desert and began to teach him supernaturally the mysteries of God and all of the things that he needed to learn. God called him to be the very first, probably, missionary to take the message of God's grace out into the world into people groups that had never heard this message before. He goes on missionary trips and he begins to go to different cities and every city that he goes, goes to, he begins to teach about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he begins to teach about the message of grace. All the cities that he goes to, he's met with resistance. He usually ends up getting beaten up or thrown in jail in each one of these cities that he goes to. But while he's there, people begin to listen. 
Hearts come alive. People begin to respond to this message of grace, and they begin to be born again and filled with God's spirit. He begins to raise up leaders to be pastors in churches. And as Elliot said, he was only five years clean. Well, some of these guys had only known about Jesus for a year, maybe two. And they were said, you're the guy that's going to pastor this church from, I got to go to the next town. It was on the job training. And he moved from town to town until one day he gets locked up and he's in jail and he's beginning to say to himself, I'm just hypothetically talking here, how is it that I'm going to carry on my ministry? I'm in jail for preaching the gospel. I can't talk to these people. I can't see these people. And the Holy Spirit gives him an idea. You're going to begin to carry on your ministry by writing letters. Don't raise your hand if you've ever been in jail and wrote letters, but I think I know how it works. Elliot can confirm. You write letters when you're in jail. This guy begins to write these jail letters, and he begins to send these letters out to these churches that he had established. The letter to the church of Thessalonians, the the, the group of the Thessalonians, this was the first letter that he wrote from jail to encourage these people. What you begin to find in these letters as he sends them out is that he refers to these people over and over and over again as people of light. He calls them that. He says, you're now people of light. You carry God's light. You must live as people of light in this dark world. He uses this theme in all of his letters to these churches that are full of baby Christians that are learning how to follow Christ. This letter that I'm about to read you a little snippet of is a unique letter because he's writing a letter to a group of Christians that he has never met. This church, he's never stepped foot in. This church, he's never been to. And he's writing this letter from a perspective of, I already know you, even though I don't know you. It's one of the reasons why I love the kingdom of God. This church, I know many, many people. But I can go, we've got friends in Honduras that have a church. I can go to Honduras Step into a church where I don't know a single face, a different name, and I can share with these people the unchanging power of God's word, and I can speak to them like I know them. Why? Listen to what Paul says to this group of Christians in Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse number 3. He says, we always pray for you, and we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, I think, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all of his glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience that you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. This letter that he's writing He's talking to this group of people that he's never met. He's speaking to them from a standpoint of, I've heard about you. I've heard the things that are happening among you. Even though I've never been 
to your city, to your church, or where you gather, there are certain things that I already know about you because these things are the very same things that I know about me. See, one of the things about following Christ and learning how to step into understanding what your role is here in this world is beginning to understand that the process that God uses to bring people to himself, it may look different on the surface. You may not have the same story that Pastor Elliot has or that I have. I was raised in the church world, a completely different story. On the surface, we may look different like, oh, I can't relate to this person because, oh, you come from a different place or you don't know the things that I've been through or anything. That's true on the surface. But when you go down below the surface and you begin to tap into the the deeper things of what makes a person a person and the heart condition and what the Holy Spirit does to transfer a person, as it says, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, there is no distinction. We are the same. We step into the same realm. We all come the same way. The narrow road that you gotta get down on your hands and knees, you've gotta get low and you've gotta enter it in, as Jesus said, like a little child. Nobody comes in all high and mighty. Nobody comes in telling Jesus, now this is what I think we're gonna do here. Jesus is like, there's no we here, buddy. Your program stays outside. We have a thing going on here, it's called the kingdom of God. And we begin to step into this, and this is one of the things that encourages me so much. My background, just really quickly, is I was a youth group kid. I was raised in church. I had parents who were in ministry, grandparents who were pastors. I had been in in the church world my whole life. And I went through my teenage years. I rebelled against all of it. I got church hurt. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I knew God had a call on my life, and I wanted no part of it. I ran as hard as I could to get away from what I knew God had wanted for my life since I was a little boy. When I finally began to surrender, it was a long process. I tell people all the time, I'm like, don't be like me. I drug my feet and I made it so difficult because at every turn, every time God would ask me to do something, I would say, why? Why do you want me to do that? I want to know why. I don't like that. I'm not doing that. I was just, I was just obstinate as a child of God to him. But God in his mercy knew what I needed and he put me in a chokehold and he said, listen here. And he began to get my attention and he began to break me down and he began to break me down in a way that I never saw coming. He used, he used the most powerful force in the world. He used his love. He broke me down in my pride and my rebellion and my arrogance. He broke it all down with his love. Every time I would resist, he would love me more until I finally just said, I can't, I can't handle this. He won my heart. When I came into the church world with a new perspective, surrendered to the call of God on my life, I began to look around and I began to tell Jesus, hey man, there's a lot of problems around here. You and me, we need to fix these people. We need to fix this whole thing, this church thing. It's all jacked up, but we're going to figure it out. And he's just like, this isn't your job. It's not your job to fix my church. And I began, to, I began to watch God do what God does around me. And this verse up here, verse number six that we just read, it talks about what Paul is saying about how the fruit of God's good news is literally changed lives. That when the good news begins to go out, it does something to the people that hear it and believe it and receive it. And what it does 100% of the time is it produces a change in our lives. Paul's writing this letter to a group of people he's never met. He cannot see them to verify your lives have been changed. He has no idea because he's never been there. How is he so confident that he can say these words that this same good news is going out all over the world and this is what it's doing? Because my friends, this is what it does. See, we... And I I say this with all the most sincere, heartfelt feeling I can. We need 
more in this world than what all the churches put together combined could possibly give. We need more than all of it. What do we need? We need more than more buildings. We need more than more incredible Easter presentations. We need more than all of it. We need the light of God to begin to infiltrate the darkness outside everywhere that we go, everywhere that we carry it. This light is given the opportunity to shine. And when it begins to shine, there are conversations that take place. There are things that begin to happen. And the end result is that lives are changed as a result of the things that we hear. One of the things that Paul says here is he begins to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of these people that he's never met. And he talks about how in verse number eight, he says that this man has come and told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given to you. The Holy Spirit literally desires to give us love for the people around us that we currently feel zero love for. The Holy Spirit desires to literally supernaturally give it to you. I don't know about you, but that's such good news for me. Because, no, I'm serious. I, I tell you the truth. My wife isn't here tonight, but she would vouch for this. When I started in ministry, I did not love people too much. It was not easy, it was not automatic. I still sized everybody up by what I saw and perceived on the outside. I didn't, it didn't come natural. I was not a naturally selfless person. God threw us into youth ministry, and if you wanna learn how to, <laughs> I mean, they just take over your world, and, and they, they it, it was, God knew what he was doing. But anyway, the love of God began to fill my heart for unlovable, what I thought were unlovable people in my path. I, test, I can testify that that verse is true, but that's not the only part about that verse that's true. The Holy Spirit was giving these people love for others, but the Holy Spirit also does a lot of other things. I wanna read them to you right now. Put that slide back up real quick. It says, the Holy Spirit this is what the Bible, when you read the whole scripture, you see all the different things that the Holy Spirit does in an active way in our lives. It says the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ, convicts us when we sin, enables us to accept Christ as our Savior, assures us of our salvation, enables us to live the victorious life, understand the Bible, pray according to God's will, and the ability to share Christ with others. These are things that in, in the Bible, it says these are things that the Holy Spirit actively desires to work in our lives. When we begin to take on the role of God and be like, okay, I have got to be all these things that the Bible says that I've got to be. And I've got to just somehow create such a disciplined path that I will just force it to happen in my life. I want you to hear this because I mean it. There are many well-intentioned Christians who are mimicking the things that they see without experiencing the actual work of the Spirit inside of them to make it a part of their life automatically. God does not want for us to mimic. That's one of the reasons why there is so much church hurt. Because people put on the mask and they're just like, I am so much better. I, I am just not what I look like I am. And we, and we begin to think we have to play a part and we have to act a part because that's what the Bible says I have to have. Do you know, want to know that God really would rather you wait on him, you seek him, you ask him? God, all these things in scripture, like it says I'm supposed to love people, but I really don't. God, can you give me that love so that I can actually feel it and I can actually do it? God, you, you tell me about the fruit of your spirit. I don't want to just fake like I've got it and just act churchy. I want to experience it so it's automatically coming out of me. I don't want to just play a part and mimic something. God, I want to live it from a place of conviction and honesty. I want to feel it. I want to know that it's real. Do you realize that that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do also? 
The Holy Spirit, the evidence of the good news is changed lives. This is the active part of what God is doing in the lives, in the minds, in the hearts of his followers. He's changing us. He's calling us into things and into places. He'll ask us to do things that, that like in the beginning, I was resistant to do, but the process of surrender and letting God do it is the process that God uses to raise us up and to teach us and to mature us into the things that he wants for us to experience automatically. He wants for every single one of us to love because we actually love. Not just, oh, I need to love. I don't know if you've ever felt love from somebody that you're just like, you don't love me. Why are you telling me you love me? You don't love me. I know you don't love me. It makes you feel all weird, like it's just a fraud. You're fake loving me right now. It's, I'm just being truthful. The Lord wants us to be able to grow and to experience the things that he is doing inside of us. This, this letter that he's writing at, towards the end of it, in verse number 12, he says these words, he says, those that live in the light share an inheritance. Verse 12 says, he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in in the light. This idea of an inheritance, one of the most amazing things about stepping into the kingdom of God and learning about our father and learning about his heart for his lost children who he's bringing home to himself is that you begin to understand that this, this relationship with God it's, it's unlike any other relationship in this world, but God in his kindness uses similarities to talk to us so that we can try to get it, so we can try to comprehend it. And one of the things that he talks about over and over in the Bible is the concept that God has an inheritance for his children. Now, in our earthly realm, the United States of America, you know, we have certain families and they've, they've saved money or they own a house or they have a car or whatever it is. Maybe it's a baseball card collection. I don't know. But we have this idea that someday when my parents pass or my dad pass or my mom or whatever, I'm going to receive something. Now the heart behind an inheritance is meant to be, I want to bestow something that I gave my life to get. I lived, worked, saved, and I got something, and I want to bestow it to you as an act of love. I want you to know for the rest of your life that you're receiving something from me, and I'm, I'm remembering you, and I'm, in, I'm enjoying what you gave to me, and it's a blessing, and it's beautiful. Why would God talk about inheritance? Why would God talk about this concept to us that there's inheritance? And this word is all through scripture that God wants for us to think in terms of he's a father who has an inheritance for us. See, in this verse that we're reading, Paul's writing this letter and he's talking. Remember, he's in jail, so he's, he's locked up and he's talking to a group of people who many of them would have a framework or an understanding of who God is through the lens of the Old Testament scriptures. They would know the prophets. They would know the writings of Moses. They would know these things that talked about their, their history as a nation the Israelites, their, their relationship with God and, and the things that God had given to them and called them into, they would have an understanding about the things that God had delivered them from and the things that God had, had instructed them to do, whether they had followed them or not. All of these things would be familiar to them. And as Paul begins to talk about inheritance and he begins to talk in the next verse about being rescued by God, he is pulling together this concept of being able to see God from an understanding of his perspective of us. See, in the book of, of Exodus, we, if you've ever read through the, 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 the story of the Exodus, you see a story of, of the people of God, the Israelites, who God had instructed them how he wanted for them to live their lives. He had given them everything that they needed and he wanted for them to have a relationship with God. 
You read through it and you see the struggle that they had. You see the way that they strayed, the way that they veered from the path that God had laid before them and how God would send, he would send prophets to them to warn them and say, hey, you have to turn back to my ways. If you don't do the things that I've instructed to you to do, there will be consequences for your choices. And eventually it led to a period of time in, in their history where they had lost their freedom. They had been free to live with God and to live for God, but because of their disobedience, they had forfeited their freedom. And God literally said, there's gonna be another nation that's gonna come take you as theirs, and you're gonna live there, and you're not gonna have your freedom anymore for a while. You're gonna be under their control. You're gonna be their slaves. You're gonna be in bondage to them. I'll still be with you. I will still be your God, but this is what you have to go through. And we read in the story of the Exodus how there was many things that led to a place where God began to come and set them free. But one of the things that God began to do is God began to speak about himself and what he desired to do on behalf of his people. I want to read just a snippet from Exodus chapter 6 because it ties to what we're reading in Colossians. It says, God speaking, he says, therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from the oppression in Egypt. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there is a absolute parallel to the life that these people were temporarily living in. See, God had spoken to them about a promised home, an inheritance. He had spoken to them about a place that he was going to take them to. He had spoken to them about all that he wanted for them to experience, and they did not belong in captivity. God never designed for you and I to live our lives in captivity. God never designed you and I to live our lives in a way to where something or someone or our own emotions would captivate us in such a way that we would literally feel like we were in chains and could not do anything else. God speaks to these people and said, enough's enough. I'm going to come in with my mighty power, my mighty arm. I'm going to reach out. I will set you free. I will literally bring you out from this place that you have found yourself living in as slaves. God literally says, I'm going to bring you with rescue out of this place that you're living. Now, going back to Colossians in verse 13, Paul's talking to this group of new believers and he's talking to them and declaring to them who God is in their lives. And he says these words, he says, for God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sin. He begins to speak about God in the same way that God spoke about God to the Israelites. He begins to speak about God taking them from, literally from the captive state in Egypt and saying, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to deliver you. And I'm going to give you your freedom in a different place, in a different way, in a different land. This parallel in scripture is so important for you and I to understand because we're talking about Jesus telling us we're the light of the world. He's talking about us learning what it means to be people of light who live in the light who walk in the light. First John talks about how when we are in the light, we have fellowship with each other and we have fellowship with God. But if we can step out of that light, things change for us, that God is calling us to live in this place. So when we begin to understand that God is literally our rescuer, that he's taking us and transferring us from darkness, a place that we that we were born into, a place that we were powerlessness, powerless in, a place that God literally says, you were here, but I'm extracting you. I am literally pulling you out, I'm rescuing you, and I'm placing you here. 
What God is trying to teach us is he's trying to teach us that you don't live there anymore. That that's not where you're from anymore. That this is no longer your home anymore. Why is this so important? Have I told you guys I was a youth group kid? <laughs> Growing up in the church. We would, we would experience these times with God where we would get fired up and we would just feel like, man, I am going to go next, be the next Billy Graham. I'm going to go and just whack, 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 take them demons out. And I'm just going to go and just powerhouse for God. Right. And, and we, would, we would do it for a minute. But we were young. We were naive. We were boys. Temptation was everywhere. It was like, I want to do what's right, but man, the flesh is weak. And we would find ourselves falling in with the crowd, doing the things that we used to do. And it was like, no, this isn't what I want to live anymore. And I would find this struggle inside of me of not really knowing who I was. My identity was all mixed up because I know I love God, but I'm acting like I don't. Who am I? See, everything about learning to, to know God and to be a light in this world has to do with beginning to understand who you are, whether you act like it all the time or not. Yeah. My truest identity is that God has transferred me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. If I could give you like some really practical ways to understand this, it's, it's as if you lived in Stockton and you moved to Galt. Okay? Some of you are like, oh, praise the Lord. Others are like, what? Yeah. Your zip code used to be 95210. It's now 95632 because I know I live in Galt. I know the zip code. We have one zip code, by the way. It's where do you live? Where, where is your home? I don't live there anymore. I, I live here. When you begin to understand all through scripture that God identifies with us, it's, it's a game changer. See, I always had this perspective that I come to Christ and I identify with Christ, which is true. Biblically, that is true. And I want to be on team Jesus and I'm going to identify with him. But I just kind of blend into the crowd and we're just like this big crowd of Jesus people. And, you know, we're all just rooting for Jesus. But do you realize that the Bible teaches something that's far more radical than that? The Bible actually teaches that God, by his plan, and I don't have enough time to go through all the verses, so I just picked out like my favorite one out of all that are in scripture. But God's plan and his, and his, in his sovereign idea, I wouldn't have done it this way, but this is what he did. In God's plan, he decided to take everything he had and invest it 1,000% inside of us. And he says, okay, you're my plan to save the world now. You're it. You're the light of the world. I'm leaving so the Holy Spirit can come and give you the power that I have. I'm just one. Jesus is like, I'm just one guy here. It's going to take a lot more than one. So I have to leave. I have to go like the kernel of wheat going into the ground so that many can come to life. I'm going to leave. The Spirit's going to come, and I'm going to begin to empower you through me, my spirit, to go out into this world and carry on the mission that I'm starting right here with this little group of Jews right here. They're listening to me right now. Did it work? Here we are thousands of years later, and we're studying these words that are so applicable to our lives today because the same good news is going out and it is still changing lives. My last verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is written referencing the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis says, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Get this. We now have this light shining in our hearts 
but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This light, this isn't a different light. This light that he's referring to is the same light that was spoken in the book of Genesis. When God said, let there be light, there was this absolute change And that same light began to go all through creation into where we live right now. The same light that Jesus spoke about is the same light that God says, I have put inside of you. And this same light is what he says is what we carry in our hearts. In a nutshell, Jesus chose us to reach the world. Fragile clay jars that are carrying this valuable treasure of God's light. See, it, I'm going to just be absolutely blunt with you. The light of God doesn't go away. It doesn't leave you when you get a bad attitude and decide, I'm done going to church. I don't want to do this anymore. I've done that a thousand times. Since I became a pastor. (laughs) Shauna, I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. She's like, just go to bed. You'll feel better tomorrow. Yes, yes, dear. It's true. The light of God, you don't have the power to put it out and to smash it away and go, I don't want it anymore. Get this light out of me. Why? Because he's transferred you from your old address into a new kingdom where you now live. Now, you may go hide. You may go wander off somewhere and be like, I don't want to be around anybody right now. I'm leaving. And that's fine. Go hide in a corner. But you're still in the kingdom of light, whether you like it or not. This is where we live. And when you begin to understand that, you make peace with that. And you begin to go, okay. Okay, so this is who I am. And if this is who I am, I want to know what it is that God wants for my life. And I want to be a willing participant of learning how to contribute and offer to God all that he's put inside of me. Because as sad as it may sound sometimes, God's plan to save this world is you and me. We're his plan. Fragile clay jars. I love that analogy. It's like, man, I just feel like I could just be squished at any moment. But I got this such valuable treasure that God put inside of me. It's him. And my friends, the longer you walk with God and the longer that you begin to experience his miracle grace and the longer that you begin to see him change other lives around you, that's been the biggest faith builder in my life by far. Watching God change other people all around me. Just go, man, I, I knew what you were like when I met you. Look at you now. It's like I can stand to be around you now. It's amazing. It's, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful, powerful thing that God does in our lives. I'm going to let Elliot come back up here in just a minute, but I want to say something to those of you that call Lifeline your home church. Um, I say this like with absolute conviction. Every single one of you are here for a specific purpose. Geographically, God planted this church in this location right here on Hutchins Street Park. This is where this church was planted because God wanted it planted here for a reason. And I don't believe that that reason has changed. And I believe that every single one of you that are here God has put his light inside of you to shine brighter and to begin to ask yourself, God, what are you wanting from my life right now that I have either been unwilling to let you have or just playing it safe and hiding back? God, that I need to step forward and I need to offer myself to you. Because there's a difference between hiding back and waiting for somebody to pick you like when we were on the playground playing kickball. Just stand here until somebody picks you. There's a difference between that and stepping forward and saying, I'll go. 
I'll go. And I'm telling you that we live in a, a time where God is looking for people to step forward and say, I'll go. I'll go. I love this church so much. I love your pastors. I love the heart. I'm rooting for this church. This church is my family. I love to be able to come places and be able to just experience the power of God's spirit and the unity of Jesus everywhere we go. And I just want to tell you guys how much I love being in this town with you. More to come.